Okay. All right, welcome to the collective call today for uh, Friday, June 16th. We have an amazing guest. Uh, Josh is gonna talk to us about Art World. Um, but before that, are there any new members on the call that wanna introduce themselves for a few seconds? I am looking and I don't see anyone. Um, all right, so let's skip that part and go straight to Josh. Uh, Josh came as an intro from Elijah. So Elijah, do you want to do the, the brief intro for Josh, please? Yeah, no, be happy to and honored to. So Josh is a buddy of mine. He's originally an East Coaster like many of you guys, but we stole him and he's now in California. Well, not now in California, but he otherwise lives here in LA, um, which is where I see him out, out here in, in these parts. But, you know, Josh is an accomplished entrepreneur and executive um, and he is, he, no one could be better for doing what he's doing than him, because he has literally been at the cross section of Web3, but also the traditional art industry and world. So hence art world, no pun intended or pun intended. And I don't want to steal Josh Thunder. He'll, he'll talk more about it, but you know, Josh has lit up projects with MoMA, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the top art institutions. And he's literally been like the Sherpa bringing these guys into the fold, um, so really excited that Josh is with us today, and um, and I'm really excited to see how the collective could be supporting Josh and um, helping to, you know, bring the Web3 world into the art world. So Josh, over to you, man. All right, Elijah, thank you so much. Uh, Max, thanks for having me. Uh, so Max wrote me this morning and said, this is a presentation, not a shill for investment, but all I have is my investment deck. So we'll we'll, we'll just ignore the ask at the very end. Um, and we'll spend a little bit more time at the, at the beginning um, telling you a little bit about what we're doing at Art World. Um, so here I will share my screen here. Okay, everyone got me? Um, I'd also say like, I am very used to being interrupted. I have three small children. So um, if you guys have questions as we're going along or just like want to go down a little sideways or just reach out, put it in the chat or just speak up and I will I will sort of do it real time. Um, so Art World, we are, we are reimagining contemporary art for a digital first world. Um, so let's talk about what that means. There's a lot of different terms in there. Let's unpack it. Um, so first, when we say contemporary art, what are we talking about? We are not talking about your nephew that has an amazing following on Instagram. We are not talking about the PFP project um, that, you know, pudgy whales or apes or anything like that. Um, you know, we are not even talking about like your local uh, art gallery, uh, unless you live in Chelsea or London. Uh, we are talking about the contemporary art world. So this is like the major art districts and New York and Chelsea and London and Shanghai. Um, this is the stuff that is, if you go to a, a art fair like Art Basel, this is the stuff that's in the main fair. These are also the, the, the solo shows and the group shows that you would see at like a place like the MoMA or Tate or, or, you know, or any of the major, major galleries around the world. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about contemporary art. Um, as Elijah said, I've been in the art space uh, for a very long time. I started my career 20 years ago at the Smithsonian American Art Museum and worked with institutional art for a very long time. Um, and then, you know, right now we're also working very much with art related NFTs, um, you know, that, with those people that are buying those. So right now we're operating at the sort of the intersection of these $2 billion markets, um, which we imagine is a very thin Venn diagram right now that will grow much fatter over the next few years as people get used to uh, Web3. Um, the big insight here is that basically every major creative medium, um, you know, if you're talking about music, film, gaming, television has gone digital first. Um, so, you know, I, I grew up in the nineties. Um, I remember the blockbusters. I remember the tower records. Um, you know, I even remember like, you know, where there's lots of game cartridges, you know, everything has gone digital first in distribution. Like that has happened. Uh, software has swallowed the world, um, except for, Fine art. Uh, fine art has always been very, very stuck in in kind of these very, uh, you know, like physical mediums. And the reason for that is this idea of the one of one, of the original, of the provenance. Um, like it was just impossible to solve that, even though uh, arguably photography, which is about 20 percent of the contemporary art market, has been digital forever. Um, it's always been a really weird kind of problem. 
And Web3, I think, solves for that. And we think there's this amazing opportunity now with Web3 where you can have one of ones which are digital. We really think this is the moment where art can go digital first. And you can take these millions of art fans, these people who are following these major galleries and artists on Instagram, and then turn them into art buyers, which was never possible before. Um, and our goal is for Art World to be the go-to destination for world-famous artists to create work that is secured on the blockchain. And we're not just talking about tokenizing JPEGs or MP4s. Um, you know, we actually think that this is going to really be almost a new medium. Um, and then there's going to be amazing opportunities, amazing art created uh, when you take world-famous artists um, who are famous for a reason, because they're usually quite brilliant. We have two MacArthur geniuses on our roster um, and give them the tools of Web3. Um, so why do we have any credibility uh, to execute this vision? So one, you know, we have a track record already. So we've already placed uh, NFTs in major museum collections. Uh, one of our works is actually on display right now, the Pompidou, which is the major contemporary art museum in Paris. Uh, they actually also acquired one of our works. Uh, one of our, our last, our, the last drop that we did with the artist Paul Pfeiffer, he's having a retrospective um, at LA MoCA in the fall. Uh, SF MoMA is talking about, we're talking to them and finalizing the deal of their acquisition. Um, basically any work that we're dropping, we're also trying to get it acquired and canonized by major collections, uh, major nonprofits, um, ma major museums. Um, and we are being also asked to participate in sort of like the highest levels of the art world. We are to them, we're art world insiders. So they trust us to operate um, in that space. Um, and the reason for that is because we've been around for quite a long time in that space. Um, I'm an Emmy award winner, um, whatever. <laughs> um, I, 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 my, my day job, I, I sometimes joke with Blue Cadet. I've had Blue Cadet for about 16 years. I, I like to joke that Blue Cadet is like 16 years old. So it's a teenager. It doesn't really need me as much. Um, whereas like Art World is my two-year-old, which is incredibly needy um, and requires a lot of my time and attention, but I love it very dearly. Um, but I've been working in the art tech innovation space for that entire time. You know, we're doing a brand new, uh, children's wing for the Met, uh, Met 81st, that'll be opening in September. We've done, you know, major, we're doing the, the digital strategy for the National Gallery of Art. Um, we are very, very deeply involved in art and tech. Nato Thompson is arguably one of the most famous uh, contemporary art curators. Uh, he has friends with all of the famous artists. He's written two seminal books um, on art, on contemporary art, uh, Scene Power and Culture as Weapon, which I suggest highly. And uh, Dina, who is our managing director, she was at Meta Open Arts for, uh, and basically, which was Meta slash Facebook's uh, uh, public art initiative. And so she was basically doing a, doing what we were doing with a $10 million budget for Meta. And Karen has worked for some of the most famous uh, artists in the world um, as their operations manager, and then was also the director of operations at Super Blue. So again, like the reason we can operate in this space is because we've already been in the space and we're very trusted. Plus we are very competent people and we can execute product. Um, and so the way the business model works is essentially you know, we have these two tiers of art that we that we do that we do. So, you know, we could. It, it's very hard, honestly, to to come up with a term for this. We um, and I, I welcome your thoughts on, on the terminology here. But basically, we have tier one and tier two. And tier one are our digital art pieces that we're selling. They're all one of ones, but the digital art ones we're selling for roughly ten to twenty thousand dollars a piece. And the idea is that these are the ones that you sell to the major museums, the collectors, uh, the people that are the people that are interested in buying these often want to display them, uh, whether in a museum, whether in a public space or in their home. Um, this is can, this is the digital art. And then we're doing this this tier two, which is collectibles. Again, one of ones, and often of like sim, like, you know, very high quality. Um, but you know, the, this is where the edition size flex is a little bit larger. Um, right now, we're dropping around the one hundred and fifty to three hundred uh, edition size. Um, but we think that this is actually the opportunity to see some really massive scale. Because again, you know, if you wanted to own a Shrin shot, for example, and Shrin was one of our artists. Um, who had a retrospective at the Broad in 2019, like unless you've got tens of hundreds of thousands of dollars and also like unless you kind of like know somebody on the inside, you're not getting one. So this is giving you access, uh, you know, you could only buy a book. Um, so now this is actually giving, giving sort of everyday art fans an opportunity to participate. Um, on the primary sale, this is a kind of a typical gallery split. 50% um, goes to the artist, 10% we give to an arts nonprofit. Um, arts nonprofits are kind of like, the engines of the art world, it's very, very, they're 
perennially underfunded. It's always a huge uh, burden on the artists actually often to support these nonprofits. Um, so they really love this idea that they could be supported in perpetuity uh, through the smart contract. Um, and then also gives us a lot of goodwill and access to also up and coming artists who are very, very hard to, to, to uh, pin down and to get, gather trust. Um, Secondary split is similar. And then we have this other thing called the secondary sale brokerage, which is what's interesting is if you look at the large galleries, uh, like the ones that are in Chelsea with the $100,000 a month uh, rent, uh, they, uh, they actually make most of their money on the secondary sales selling tier one style art to other collectors. So uh, we imagine that we're actually going to see a lot of revenue through that brokerage. Uh, ultimately. So we imagine the tier twos will kind of go on to OpenSea or they'll be so transacted on our platform. But we really think tier one is going to be more of uh, about selling within our collector pool. So it's a really, it's really exciting there. And the other thing too, is like, unlike the traditional art world, which has to spend a lot of time in shipping, creating, boxing up things and, and, uh, you know, but it, this all, this is all digital. So it can happen obviously almost instantaneously through the blockchain. Um, there's some really amazing affordances that happen once, when art goes digital, um, in terms of the competitive landscape, uh, if what we're really looking at is this upper left-hand quadrant, which are like the major, major mega galleries. These are generally anywhere between 500 to billion dollar businesses. Um, and, you know, they're very, very brick and mortar. And, I, and when I say brick and mortar, I mean, it's not even brick. I mean, it's like marble. It's like very high. It's terrazzo. It's very, very high end. Um, and, you know, this the, the artists that we're working with are in the rosters of these, of these galleries. Um, but we are digital first. These are very physical. We are very digital. Um, the only player right now that we think is sort of of note is Pace. Um, they've put millions of dollars. Uh, they've seen the opportunity in Web3, um, but frankly, they're not really digital first. <laughs> you know, they're, they're sales first. Um, so there, there's a lot of things that they, they have a lot of buyers, but they don't actually have a lot of ability to produce products. So whereas they can really only drop projects periodically, um, we can drop them at a much faster um, pace because frankly, oh, that's, that sounds like a pun, uh, but we're, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're just, we're, I'm used to from Blue Cadet shipping product and I know how to, I know how to get work actually produced. Um, and then also, you know, we can give them really best in class uh, digital web three innovation. So a lot of artists want to do things with AI, with generative, with AR, any XR. Um, you know, we have all the relationships and the tech and the capabilities to make that happen. Um, so our progress so far is, you know, we raised one point one eight million dollars. We've launched six projects uh, since uh, almost a year ago. It's like we're, I think we la launched our first project late June of last year. Um, our last three projects, the tier twos, which are the the collectible editions, sold out in less than two hours. Uh, we are on the cover of Art in America magazine, which is a very big deal. Uh, we've been covered by all the major art press. Uh, NFT Now named our first project one of the most unforgettable NFT drops of uh, 2022. Uh, we've already chaired symposiums at the Hammer Museum. We did some work with Neue House. I'm actually going to be doing a whole lecture series. I've been asked to do a, a recurring lecture series uh, at Neue House Venice, uh, which I'll be kicking off in July. Uh, a lot of that will be based on uh, Web3. Um, and then again, we know we were we were acquired by the Pompidou, uh, Cadiz, which is a major, major uh, collecting foundation, and SF Momo will be closing soon. Um, this is basically what we sort of see as our projections. Um, you know, these are kind of corrected for the for the crypto winner. We think this is very, very attainable. Um, you know, I think the idea is that after three years of operating in the space, assuming that there's a little bit of a crypto thaw um, after this point, you know, we're get, and and we are able to secure ourselves as the go-to destination for art by world famous artists secured in the blockchain. There are going to be tremendous opportunities for venture style scale. Um, but right now, we think this is a a responsible uh, model for the projecting the next uh, three years. Um, I'll ignore the investment. Uh, <laughs> And then quickly, this is just sort of a case study just to show you like, what does this stuff actually look like? Uh, this is one of our projects that we did with the artist Jill Maggot. Jill Maggot is a, she's faculty at uh, Cooper Union, which is considered probably the best undergraduate art program in the world. Um, she has had solo shows at the Whitney. Um, she did this project called Out Game Flowers, where she took, uh, we, we basically found the Ukrainian hackers uh, that went in and stripped out the sprite sheets uh, from all these different video games like World of Warcraft and Mario um, and Minecraft and um, 
basically assemble these collages. Um, so these are actually uh, what you would call ready-mades. So if you look at that purple flower there, um, that's a black lotus flower from World of Warcraft. That thing is actually worth like about $200,000 in like real currency. Um, and there, and because of that, there's actually like in-game surveillance networks um, that have been programmed to like mine these things. So what's really interesting is it's a really interesting ex exploration of what does value look like in a digital space. And it, and it speaks a lot to the metaverse. It speaks to a lot to like uh, digital scarcity. Um, it's it's fascinating. Uh, for all these projects, we're also creating the last four projects. We've created these like little uh, explainer videos, you know, like little like mini R21 style videos. So if you go onto our website, you can watch those. Jill is a uh, fantastic and articulate um, I, I'm artist and can speak to her work. Uh, then also, if you were in Paris, you could actually see this work um, on display at the Pompidou for the next few months. So that kind of ends it right now. I will open it up to any questions and I'm happy to talk more about art world or any other thing. Thanks, Josh. That was awesome. Um, and, you know, I know you skipped the slide, but you are taking investments. So if yes. people uh, like this project, please reach out to Josh we, directly. We, we kicked it off the Series C this week. Very, very, very. <laughs> we'll share very, the info. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we, for, we like to go to Lou for questions first. Lou, are you in a place where you can ask a question? Uh, I think so. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, what have been the major learnings to date? The major learnings to date. Um, so the one thing that's really interesting is I would say that the art, people, even people really care about how it's displayed. The art, like they, even, even people who are like Web3 natives, um, that's, that, you know, might, might be able to just like put it in their, you know, open C account or like view it on MetaMask. They actually are very concerned about actually being able to like present this in some ways, and that and like I think this thesis that art is identity um, is a very important one. You know, in some ways, art is not unlike fashion, which is like the way that you dress. You know, the things that you have, you want other people to see those things. So if you have uh, you know an amazing wardrobe, but it's in your closet and you're not allowed to leave, leave the house with it, like that's a problem. Um, so one of the things that we've really found is even on the collectible side, um, you know, we we really have to figure out. How how to make the stuff um, viewable, shareable, displayable. Um, like that's actually a much bigger affordance than we thought. I mean, I think that you saw this with like the PFP collections where people are using them as their, as their avatars. Um, and I think that was sort of overlooked in a lot of ways that like, that was actually the utility of the PFP, which was, which was to show that, you, which, which is that it was able to show up publicly in those spaces and say, Hey, I have an ape, I have a doodle, I have a pump. Um, and that, you know, what we're, so we're, I'm actually meeting uh, with the CEO of Infinite Objects, which make these beautiful sort of digital Lucite screens next week in New York, um, you know, to talk about like creating a, a sort of more formal partnership with them. You know, we're talking to some of these like larger screen manufacturers about kind of getting some beautiful screens in public spaces. But I think one of the things that we realized is like that is actually way more important. Yeah, this is the super interesting. If you're in New York, uh, give a buzz. We can grab beer. And the last question I didn't quite understand. You showed that one slide um, with that you know, blue rose you said was worth $200,000. Yes, and yes, yes. So, do, do you actually get that? as part of buying the digital art. So I was a little confused on, on how the no, value no, no. It was, kind of no, from no, one was, related to the other. No, 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 it's not really. So so basically the way that Jill can actually sort of take those, take those artifacts and assemble them together and sell them is because it's a collage, it's an assemblage. And we also have very good lawyers on staff to make sure what are the, uh, you know, what what is permissible. Um, but no, that's, it's basically what she did was she took the source code of that, of that flower and she and she used that to assemble that the bouquet. So the thing is that what's, what's interesting about that is that there wasn't she didn't recreate those objects. Those are all digital objects that she was able to then sort of render and collect. So it, it was more of a conceptual move. It, it doesn't include the works or anything like that. But what's also really interesting is I I have a ten year old son, okay. um, and he's able to recognize like eighty percent of the the things in that bouquet, which which I find like fascinating. You know, so you know, like you know, I I, I think it's just really interesting to see that there's a whole world out there um, that this next generation is aware of, and then also like accrues a lot of like they see a lot of value in those things. Um, that that people who are not in these sort of like metaversal type spaces recognize. 
Now it makes a lot of sense. Uh, uh, exciting stuff. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Lou. Uh, I'll go to Elijah next because obviously uh, this is your connection. So do you have any questions for for uh, Josh? Well, this is one I've, I, I, I've asked to him, but I think it's a fun one for, for this group. But just segmentation wise, you know, like um, there's a lot of uh, obviously like, you know, more mature, I'd say, uh, art collectors that are not mm -hmm. far from crypto natives, right? right. Um, that would be natural fits for some of the collections that you're putting out. How, how do you reconcile for the fact that they don't have a MetaMask wallet and they're not, they're, you know, they're older, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, so I would say that like right now, you know, like if I were to look at like, you, everyone's familiar with the, the concept of a Venn diagram, you know, the overlapping circles, you know, we're, we're, people are very, very excited is if you understand technology or Web3 at all, or, you know, or you can get your head around what that's about and you understand art, meaning that like you just recognize maybe 10% of the, the artists that are on our roster. Um, like this is the most exciting project in the world. People get super, super jazzed. Um, and like, but then there's people on the other side where there's people who are like, they understand, they know all the artists on a roster, but they really don't understand Web3 or they really understand Web3, but they don't understand the art of the roster. And part of our challenge and our and what we're doing is sort of like pushing those circles together, you know, and, and there is some natural motion, you know, but like we've been spending a lot of time, particularly on the tier ones with these like old school art collectors, um, educating them, getting them set up on wallets, um, you know, showing, you know, get, getting, you know, helping them understand conceptually, but then also just practically how to do this. And what's what's crazy to me is like I, 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 I made this joke. One of our collectors is. Um, she is on the she she's on the board of the Whitney. Um, her family owns a major New York sports team. Um, you know, I was talking to her about acquiring one of their shit in the shot works. And she was like, I just don't get NFTs. I just don't get it. Like I like, you know, like I and I was like, Well, do you have any digital art? She's like, Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I have you know, a Leo Villarreal in Sag Harbor. And I got a, you know, a, like she got rattled off all these different digital artworks that she had in her four different homes. And I was like, I was like, well, you know, the NFT is just literally that the certificate of authenticity that you stuck in your drawer. You know, she's like, wait, I can put this on screens. I was like, yeah, you can put this on screens. And I was like, she, she's like, well, can I transfer it from a screen that's in Sag Harbor to Aspen? I was like, yeah, you can do that. I was like, she's like, oh my God, that's amazing. And I was like, yeah, it's amazing, right? I was like, so I think once you start getting, you know, once you start kind of breaking down some of those those uh, those weird kind of mental constructs, um, people get very, very open to this and get very, very excited by it. But yeah, right now there's a lot of education on both sides, honestly. And then also you have to explain to the Web3 folks, but like, well, why is, you know, why is this artist more artistically relevant you know, what's different about their practice than this like DJ in Estonia that I, you know, bought from Super Rare, you know, and it's like, and honestly, sometimes, you know, like I think our, you know, I, I, I'm not just like not, I, I think also one of the things they're really interested in is like also finding some of those DJs in Estonia that are, that are awesome and bringing them into those conversations too and giving them a real conceptual practice. I mean, you know, a lot of our artists are educators, you know, and we want to see that mixing. Like we want to see more art, great art being created. So it's not really just this like snobby play to like just operate here, but to like really, you know, make sure that we can like bring some like really conceptual underpinnings to the art that's being produced in this space. Love it. All right, Marco. Great presentation, Josh. I'm curious, you said people really care about how the art is being displayed. Are you translating that only to how it's being displayed? digitally or are you because of your conversation with infinite objects putting time and effort into pop-ups or galleries or actually showcasing the real world oh yeah 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 so i would say it's what, what's funny is like if you guys look up blue cadet or if you look up creative time which is where nato came from so blue cadet is an experience design studio so we do tons of stuff in physical space so like we just did like a brand new museum for mit which if you're in boston you should totally check out like i've been operating in physical tech like tech where technology manifests physically for like my entire career and nato actually he kind of really cut his teeth um at creative time which if you guys remember there was a giant sugar sculpture that kara walker did at the um at the domino sugar factory in new york um, like that was creative time. So, you know, a lot of what we're doing at, at art world is kind of the same playbook, which is saying like, okay, you're taking an artist that's very, very famous in one medium and you're helping them operate in another, but also to say like, 
we're very, we're very, very used to making things manifest physically. And like, that's something we're very, very interested in. Um, so we're actually talking right now about doing a, uh, a sort of a large physical activation at, in London with one of our upcoming artists, uh, Marco Brambia um, at Freeze London. Um, and we have a lot of relationships also, like Karen was also the, um, the director of operations at Superblue, um, which if you guys haven't been or you don't know about it, check it out. It's superblue.com. It's super cool. It's, um, again, like a place where digital art manifests at like massive scale. So like we're very, very interested in how these things manifest large publicly, but then also, you know, trying to get people displays in their homes. Try, I mean, honestly, just like also even just like helping people print some of these things out, um, you know, like because like, frankly, if you could, what's really bizarre is like, if you go to some of these art fairs and you start looking around and you're like, okay, how much this stuff was actually like paint? And how much of this stuff is like actually just like put out on a really high end plotter, you know, like a lot, there's, there's much more digital art in the world than I think people realize. They just, for some reason, they think that once it's like printed out and signed that it takes on some sort of like new manifestation. It's like, it's just digital art. So to me, like a di digital does not need to mean that it has to be like constantly spinning on a screen. Uh, and as a follow-up, if you uh, do want an introduction to the WIM uh, digital canvas team, I'm in really close contact with them. Yeah. They have some really high quality stuff. I can provide that. Um, and, and as a follow-up though, I'm curious, out of the 40% that you take, I mean, that's definitely on the higher end, if not yeah. the highest yeah, yeah. end. Um, does that include, I mean, I saw on your website, you, you bring artists into the digital world. Does that include like helping them, like you were saying, like introducing them to AI or introducing them to technology or like what does that 40% actually cover? Yeah. So, so that's, a, that's a really good question. I should have known. So right now, like the way that we're, the way that we're doing this is like, we're commissioning these pieces. So we're working with these artists conceptually to help produce the pieces. Um, so they, there's, there, you know, there aren't, uh, there, there really haven't been any artists that have come to us and just like as a marketplace and said, Hey, just resell our art. You know, we're actually saying like, okay, even if they're digitally native, we're helping them create a, a unique collection that can be that that we think that will be interesting to our audience um, or to the or that like extends their practice in a meaningful way. So that we end up putting a lot of labor into these things. I mean, right now we're also talking to some of these sort of more natively web three digital artists, because um, there are a few that we think are actually doing phenomenal work. Um, and for them, we'll probably cut a better deal, you know, because they won't require as much production. They, those things might be a little bit more good to go. Um, we might put a little bit more marketing into those works, um, but they, they won't require as much of a production lift. Thank you. Marco, Marco forgot to mention he's so humble. He's an incredible artist, Josh. You guys oh, okay. should talk about Well, yeah, that. yeah. Reach out. I'm just, yeah, josh at artworld.com <laughs> or josh at bluegood.com. They all, all roads lead to my inbox. Yeah, I was going to say that uh, Marco is a resident artist. Um, we're trying to get more into the collection, but, you know, so far, so far it's Marco. Um, Sean, you're next. Yeah, uh, I'm so curious how demand has been for your guys' services. I mean, first of all, congratulations on all you guys have managed to accomplish so far. It seems amazing. But I'm curious uh, if the recent NFT slump has affected you guys at all, if you guys are more following the art market or how how that's been working out for you no i mean so we we were able to sell out our last three drops um very very quickly um and i mean part of that is you know we we have really good relationships with other sort of groups within the space within the space um you know so some of those other uh you know nft platforms like arsenal that's uh, like on the quadrant uh with us you know we we actually have like a really good relationship with their collectors and and you know we give them at, we give them sort of whitelist access um to to our drops so you know uh, two two of the three drops actually sold out in the whitelist phase they didn't actually go to the public mint um, only the last minute because we actually charged a lot more for it, uh, went to public and then that, then that sold out in less than two hours. And, but also like we, we did that because we wanted to actually get to the public mint, just to, like test that out. Um, but we've been able to sell out, we've been able to sell out pretty well. I mean, I think right now, you know, we're just being a little bit conservative about the scale. So, you know, trying to like selling like 150 to 300, I think is actually you know, fairly is like pretty attainable in this market because like it's a very high quality product. Um, and I and actually what we're seeing is like a lot of the crypto whales, like they're like we we limit the number that they're that people are allowed to buy to three. Um, but then what we're seeing is that a lot of these like bigger crypto whales are actually picking up some on the secondary market. So, um, you know, it, it, even though we resist consolidation, like there are people that are very uh, they, they get what we're doing and they get how we are 
a, a good hedge against you know what what NFTs were and a and a good sort of prequel to what NFTs can be. So um, no, we we've actually we, and you know our next projects too. Uh, like we actually they're they're pretty cool. You know they're pretty. I think I'm pre- I'm pretty I'm pretty confident they'll sell out. Yeah, awesome! Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Sean. Um, any more questions? I can ask some questions. Um, I gotta wait till uh, till the end to give our members a chance. Um, so you've talked about what uh, you know the traditional art collectors think about the NFT space and how they, you know, you know the example you gave. They have really no idea that you can display your artwork in a in a digital uh, canvas. Um, but what do artists think about when you approach them to do? Uh, you know, traditional artists think when you approach them to do a, a digital uh, work. So, you know, part of that comes back to NATO's reputation. So like NATO, NATO's whole reputation, you know, in public art was helping someone who had one practice area, like do something like in another practice area without like falling on their face. So, um, so Kara Walker, you know, if you go to the MoMA, there's like literally like a 30 foot mural of her work or, or of her work on the permanent collection. It's like this beautiful cutout, black and white cutouts. Like she's, she has this iconic work. Um, but probably the work that she's best known for is actually the, the, pro, the public art project uh, called A Subtlety, uh, which you guys should def- definitely check out. I can also send the links around um, that she did with Creative Time, which is this massive 300 foot sugar sculpture. And, you know, like, Part, you know, the thing is like a lot of artists, they'll go from one medium to the other and they'll fall on their face. And artists are very reputationally driven. I mean, like these, a lot of these artists honestly have, have achieved a financial level of success. Like they just want to be in the history books. Like, and they don't want to, they don't want to, they don't, they, they love their collectors. They don't want to like screw their collectors. They, they love, they love the fact that they're in museums and they get invited to all the, the really nice galas and parties. They love, you know, and like, they want to be, they, they, they're very concerned about their legacy. So like for them to jump over and make a quick buck in like nifty gateway is like untenable. So we give them a very, very safe space to operate. Um, we work with them to make sure that they've got a really good project, um, that it deploys really well, that it like, that it like operates at the same level as their other work. Um, and like, honestly, like the number of artists that we have, um, that are interested in working with us, like far exceeds our ability right now to like service them. And these are world famous artists. These are really amazing projects. That's awesome. Um, I have another question, but Lou raised his hand. Lou, what's up? I was wondering if you could talk about uh, where it's happening. Like, for instance, you you, you mentioned uh, Paris and the Pompidou. And yeah, I, I know yeah, that uh, they have a really strong ecosystem in Paris. Totally. Uh, Lou, I think you cut out in the middle of your question. I think, were you asking about like geographically where 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 are these things happening? Yeah, like, geographically. Where, where, yeah, where, where where is this happening? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I'll say um, yeah. I, I'm biased, but I think LA has got an amazing scene um, for for art and NFTs. I think you know LACMA has been really ahead of the curve there. They they've got some really fantastic curators mm-hmm. um, that are that are really future future oriented. No, I just uh, don't want to get caught off guard. What's that? Oh, sorry. Can you hear me, guys? All right. Yeah, sorry, Tim didn't mute. So I mean, oh, okay, all good. Okay, no, no, no all good. Um, okay, so I would say that Berlin is fantastic. There's some really amazing uh, art and art, art curators there. London is fantastic. New York is always, you know, New York's in New York. Um, you know, it's funny, like, uh, I think those those are like the, you know, it's like, there's definitely some hot spots in Asia and the Middle East. Um, you know, Dubai is, I would never, not, never sleep on Dubai. Um, I mean, particularly what's also very interesting too, is like, um, if you look at some of the, the Middle Eastern countries, like those cities are being sort of like, there, there's like these new districts in Saudi Arabia that are being basically like built from the ground up and like are very, very digitally forward. And there's lots of like digital surfaces. Um, you know, it's like, you know, it's funny because you look at like Times Square where they've been doing a, like a lot of these like art NFC activations. Um but like that's but that but that's been like retrofitted from like Times Square from like the 50s, whereas like Dubai is like digital first and like they're going to and they have a, and they're hungry for content. 
Um, so there's there's a lot, you know, if you think about any of these like really like new economies or investing in like new architecture, new infrastructure, have a lot of like digital screens and surfaces, like any of those places are very, very hungry for digital content and like high quality digital content. Um, so that's where that's where we see it. there's there's a lot of great opportunity there. I don't know. I, I don't know if I missed any. If anybody wants to advocate for any geography that I've missed, I mean, these are only the places I've been paying attention to. No, I think you covered it all. Um, <laughs> Super interesting. But so, what do you think in terms of the artists? What do you think that the artists are missing the most in terms of understanding the dynamics of the marketplace? Um. I think the artists, I mean, the artists are, these are usually very, our artists are, tend to be very savvy. Like I think most of our artists have a very deep conceptual practice and they think a lot about currency. They think about, they think about society. They think about how it's structured. Um, so I think also for them, it's a very interesting mental, like it's an interesting exercise because this, because obviously web three is sort of like an inflection point in how value is like transmitted. Um, and a lot of our artists, like they, that's, that's part of their conceptual practice. Um, and they're, brilliant artists. I mean, like most of our, you know, the, the work is beautiful, but, but I think what's really interesting is the work is also very conceptually rich. It's interesting. There's like layers of meaning. Um, so most of our artists, like they're as eager to get into the, the to the ideas. Um, and like, also like NATO's like written like seminal books on art and power. Um, so like, they're very interested in getting into the conversation, um, and sort of understanding like that, those mechanics. And I think, I think then what's really interesting with their really, what, then it's like figuring out like, okay, what can actually, what are the things that can only be done when you're creating art that's transacted on the blockchain? So, you know, like looking at the affordances of like a, a platform like Solidity um, or the, a programming language like Solidity. And that's where things get really exciting. And then I think sometimes it's us just like dialing it back so they don't, you know, just make something that's like a ghastly, um, you know, over-indexing of Solidity features. I don't know if that answered your question, Lou. Um, uh, it's, it's super interesting stuff. I mean, obviously, you're at the forefront of this brand new thing. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, for us, it's like, the, but for the artists, too, it's, like, super exciting because, you know, a, a lot of our artists, like, they have they 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 have like their they have like their patronage band you know they have like their you know like the major museums and collectors that support them and the galleries but like sometimes it's like even if you even like the most successful artists might only have like a thousand people that actively or hundreds of pe hundred people that actively consume their work so to for so for these artists to be able to actually produce work that can be owned you know by a large number of people that they that like so that I could personally own a Jill Magid um, rather than just owning a book about Jill Magid, you know, like that's a huge thing. And I think it's, a, it's really, really exciting for these artists because, you know, these artists, like a lot of them want to be more of the people um, and they want to also, and like the, I, the other thing I did mention too, is that we are bringing artists into like Twitter spaces and discords and videos and events. Um, so we're, we're creating a, we're sort of disintermediating and sort of like, I, I sometimes I, I said like kind of like burning the velvet rope. Um, you know, like you don't have to go through like UBS to get to these artists now, like you, you know, like, or like your Chase Sapphire Platinum, whatever, you know, to get into a, into, you know, to get to some, you know, fancy little dinner held at Art Basel. Like we are creating more and more opportunities to create direct connections between people that love the art and the artist, which I think is like, honestly, the great power of Web3 and promise of Web3. Um, so, and the, and our, and our artists are totally game on. Right. Yeah, I thought that was the promise of Web two, but it didn't turn out so much. No, 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 no. The promise of Web two was <laughs> was was to, was to make Instagram wealthy by selling sweatpants. Uh, thanks, Lou. Uh, Marco. Hey, Josh. Yeah, I'm curious how the uh, children's wing for the Met is taking shape and how that fits in with the overall art world. Uh, oh, that's a that's a that's a blue that's a blue cadet project. Oh. oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'll it, if you guys are curious, I'll drop a. There you go. Here's the here. It's, this hasn't this hasn't yet been announced. This is a this is more on the this is that's that's my uh, that's that's my blue cadet thing. But here this is. You guys are in New York. And you have children. This will be opening in September. Sweet. Oh, actually, Max, could I could you would you mind if I drop the link for the for the deck in, in there? Or is that yeah? Is that, please, no problem. Okay, here we go. All right, I'm gonna do this real quick. If you guys, and feel free. And again, not a hard sell. Not a hard sell. Um, but if you're curious, 
There's also more art. I took uh, I took my kids to the Met. Um, must have been like a couple months ago, and yeah. the only the only thing that I could get them into was the the Egypt thing. Yeah, um, <laughs> they, they glossed over all the art. Oh, did you did you see the did you see the AR thing the uh, the the one where they had the polychrome they colored in Greek no stuff? I missed that I must have missed that we did the oh, Egyptian okay. thing and then we had lunch and then we left okay <laughs> we did a yeah so Blue Cadet did a really fun uh, AR app for the Met uh, called Met Chroma where you could actually see the the uh, the, the black and white sculptures in color um, very cool spoiler they weren't all white <laughs> nice. It was a, it was a, it was a lot, lot more skin tones than, than, uh, <laughs> than, the, than the Proud Boys would have you believe. Um, awesome. um, I have a question since uh, we're still we're waiting for other people to kind of chime in. It's a quiet Friday, um, but I was wondering what your artists uh, that you've kind of taken on think about your two different models. Um, are some drawn more to doing like ten pieces and some more do, drawn to doing, you know, more? And I know, you know. Like when I talk to artists, they kind of balk at the fact that, you know, you need like 500 to a thousand pieces yeah. um, of all this, uh, of the artwork to really have a good collection where you can charge a reasonable amount of money and get a bunch of uh, collectors in. Yeah. Um, so, totally. what, so what do like traditional artists think about that? Well, I, I would say, you know, part of it is like, you know, we've been learning as we've been going along, you know, so, um, you know, the first pro, you know, the first project we did was called Vessel of Gratitude with Waleed Rod. Waleed's also a partner uh, at Art World. He's a, probably one of the most famous artists in the Middle East. He's had like a solo show at MoMA, uh, also faculty at Cooper Union for a long time. Um, and, you know, basically, um, you know, like that, that was one where we created these like cakes for dictators uh, or like and, they, and you could go in there and you could actually take the cake and you could. You could you could you could slice it, and they would turn into all these one of one slices. And we were going to be dropping them on the birthdays. We were actually supposed to debut at Christie's, but then Christie's got cold feet, um, which is fine. Like I'm friends with them; They're, it was fine. Um, but you know that was so. But that was one where we're like the drop mechanics were like spread out too much. It was a little. It was we sold a ton of them, but like it was. But it, it, it was a, it was a little messy, and I might want to relaunch part of that project. The second project with Sharid Nishat, she only wanted to do tier one. She didn't want to do anything that was that was inexpensive. Um, so those sold out instantly, um, but she refused to do tier two. Um, you know, and then like the last three projects, like that's where we really kind of like figured out how to sell these things and how to like activate networks. And we, we've gotten a critical mass and those we've been able to sell out um, the tier twos very easily. Um, the tier ones are still very handholding, um, you know, but we sold out a lot of those as well. Um, but I would say now that we've shown that we can sell out the larger editions, the, the artists are totally on board. And ultimately, like, you know, what we're trying to do now is just make sure that every project does both a tier one and a tier two, um, because the tier one really credentializes in some ways because it because we put them in the big collections. Um, and, you know, and then the, the tier two is where we want to really allow for more broader access. And, you know, and like, honestly, artists know if they're going to work with us now, like, that's what we do. Like, frankly, we couldn't make sure and do that because she was our second artist, you know, <laughs> and like, she's very famous. Uh, she's probably the most famous uh, living Persian artist. And, you know, what you're in once, but she actually came back to us now and is actually interested in doing a tier two, which I, which I think is very exciting. Love it. Uh, my last question is about generative art. Um, yes. Since I'm a big collector. What, what are, you know, as an artist yourself, and as an art collector yourself, what are your thoughts on kind of, you know, what are considered to be the seminal pieces of art in the blockchain right now? You know, yeah. the squiggles, the fidenzas, and also, are you going to be uh, putting generative artists on your platform? Uh, great question. Um, so one of our artists was Kevin McCoy and Jen McCoy. So Kevin McCoy is the creator of the first NFT. Um, so he's got some credibility there, which I think sold at Sotheby's for quite a bit, um, called Quantum. Um, and that was a very much a generative art project. So it was a generative art project that also used AI, um, it used uh, stable diffusion to create and also use these silhouettes from um, essentially Ansel Adams uh, photographs to create these generative collages. And they're beautiful. They're awesome. I, I highly recommend them. Um, and, you know, like to me, like the that was a, you know, Kevin, obviously, like he created the first NFT, like he's like an OG, you know, generative artist, like it was not 
hard to get him to do that work. Um, but you know, a lot of the work is generative. Like all the, all the, all the, uh, all the bouquets were generative to a certain degree. I mean, we, you know, we like, they were all kind of, hand, we went in there and generated them and then like hand kind of positioned them, but there was a lot, but there's a big generative workflow um, in order to get, you know, 300 of uh, one-on-ones. So like in some ways, like I love generative and we love generative. It's just a question of like, what does generative look like? I think there's a very, sometimes a very specific aesthetic um, for generative, which, you know, like I'm not always that into, um, I mean, that's just like a personal taste thing. Um, but you know, we're doing stuff We're we are going to probably produce some work that does look like that, you know, that, that, that may, that might be more abstract, um, and, and fall into that aesthetic. But then like most of the work that has the tier two has some generative aspect to it. Um, and, and I think really, um, what we're really interested in is figuring out like, you know, how do you broaden the definition of what generative actually means, you know, and how do you, how do you broaden out, like, what, um, you know, what, when someone thinks generative that they don't automatically just think of something that looks like a processing um, tutorial, you know, which, but, and by the way, like I came up as a flash developer way back in the day. So like, totally get it. I've created a lot of generative work myself. I, lo I love it. And I also know the elegance of, the, of that code. Um, I personally think like the squiggles are beautiful and like conceptually really interesting and, and iconic. Um, you know, um, I wouldn't mind having one. Um, but, you know, like, but, you know, it's like, but, but, you know, I, I think the idea is like, yeah, we want to, we want to, we want the work to be, we're, we're going to, we're going to produce some awesome artwork, you know, some, and it will all have some generative aspect to it in some ways, even if it doesn't look generative. Amazing. Well, thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that answer. Hi right, guys. Um, Josh is going to be around New York city and then in the Hamptons. Yes. So uh, my short announcement is that we're going to be doing at Crypto Mondays Hamptons at the public house. And it's actually going to be pub, uh, Crypto Mondays on a Tuesday. Ah, um, so this is going to be Tuesday at 4.30 uh, next week. So that's the, tw oh, the week after, the 27th of June. So hopefully you can come out, Josh, and uh, meet some crypto oracle members. Yeah, I'd love to. And of course, Josh is also going to come and join us at um, Hamptons Tech Week. So that's going to be a lot of fun as well. Um, all right, guys, Johnny has an announcement before we, we, let, we let everyone go. Thanks so much, Josh. Uh, thanks so much, Max. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Lou, for having me. Elijah, thanks, thanks so much for making the introduction. Truly appreciate it. Um, reach out, Josh at Blue Cadet or Josh at Art World. Happy to, happy to follow up anyway. Amazing. Thanks, Josh. Johnny? That was awesome. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, I'll be real quick. I have, um, for those of us who are in the DAO, meaning that you have either earned or purchased tokens, uh, we are now on Snapshot, and I'm really happy to announce that because Snapshot allows us to do gasless voting. So no longer will you have to spend $3 to make your voice heard um, in this DAO. And so I'm putting a proposal in the chat that is going to be open for 24 hours. It's not the um, it's not the highest stake proposal in the world, but it is a great way for us to learn um, how to use Snapshot and iron out any bugs before something important happens. So if you have a moment, I'd love to not have to redo this because um, if we don't hit quorum, I'll have to do it again next week. Uh, but if you have tokens, I'd love for you to vote either for, against, or abstain on a minimum token per hour um, idea. And uh, yeah, it's the the link is in the is in the chat. And if you have any questions, reach out to me via text or email. I'm happy to help anyone out. Thanks, Johnny. Um, don't abstain, by the way. It's like the biggest cop out in Dow voting. Abstain yes is or fine. No. As long as we hit, as long as we hit quorum. <laughs> um. All right, guys. Uh, thanks, Johnny, for putting that together. We are uh, we're starting to uh, you know resemble a real Dow, um, which is exciting. All right. Does anybody else have anything else for the last six minutes? Thanks, Elijah, for making that connection. That was a great presentation by John. Yeah, my pleasure. All right. Well, enjoy your weekend. Um, and we'll see you guys on Monday. Bye, all.